Yes, so today I, I want to talk about these objects and they will be sort of the main objects of study and so this is where I will, the symplectic in homology will be an invariant of these things. So first I want to explain what they are, what you do with them, what kind of questions you ask about them. So since I only have an hour about today, so that, that should just about fill that hour. So um, let me start sort of slowly again. So su suppose we have a compact symplectic manifold with boundary. And then let's also assume that omega is actually exact. Then if that's the case, then uh, we can dualize this one form, there's a unique vector field, I mean the same way I did this for, for the differential of a, of a function, like I said, whenever I have a one form I can turn it into a vector field, so that's what I'm going to do with this lambda. So there exists a unique vector field y, such that if I insert y into omega, I get lambda, this time I don't uh, put a sign here. And so if you put these things together, you'll find that um, the note that if I take the lead derivative in the direction of this vector field y of the symplectic form omega, then by Carton's formula this is d of the insertion of y plus the insertion of i into d of omega, but now um, d omega is closed, is, is zero, so we just get d of the insertion, so we just get d of i y omega, but i y omega was lambda, so this is d lambda, so this is just omega. So the flow of this y has the property that it expands the symplectic volume, because the the lead derivative of the of the form is the form itself. So, basically, by the by the flow, the flow of pi when it exists uh, expands omega in the sense that. Back my my symplectic form by the flow, and it gets multiplied by e to the t. Right. So as time gets bigger, this this gets rescaled by a large constant. Okay. So now, um, now I have, I said I have a compact manifold with boundary. So so if I have boundary, of course my flow will not be defined for all time because I might run into the boundary. So, but I can make an additional assumption. My additional assumption will be that this vector field y, which I have here, is transverse to the boundary. Right, so basically, I have a domain like this, and maybe it has boundary. Right, so it might have some pieces here, and then it has boundary here, like that. So this is the boundary, and I'm asking that my uh, vector field y, which is called the Liouville vector field, I'm asking that that's transverse to the boundary, and there are two cases. It could either sort of along a connected component of the boundary, then it could either point, point out, or it can point in. So let's call 
boundary plus of the W are the components where Y points out. And del minus are the components where it points in. Right? Okay. And let me just just to sort of see what what kind of things we can have. Here's an example in an exercise. So suppose we have a surface. with some boundary components and an area form. So let sigma omega be a compact surface with an area form. And suppose we're given, so then sigma will have some positive area so, and then the claim is, if I give myself real numbers for each of the boundary components, so for any collection, real, of real numbers, AI, where sort of the number of, of real numbers I, I have is corresponds to the number of boundary com components, with the property that the summation of the AI should be the, the area of sigma. There exists, oh, and I want to assume that all the AI are non different from zero. Then there exists a primitive, such a, such a lambda, for omega, such that the integral of lambda over the ith component of the boundary, so let's name them gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, gamma 4, um, so a compact surface with boundary, so I have r boundary components and I have r numbers here, And then for each, for the ith boundary component, the integral is exactly AI. And lambda restricted to gamma I is nowhere zero. Right? And then what that means is that if I take this particular primitive, then depending on whether AI is positive or negative, if it's positive, then my, my Y will point outward, right? So I can take this primitive, so, the Liouville vector field, Y associated to this lambda, will point out if AI is positive and in if AI is negative. So that's, that's all part of the exercise. And so, so basically on a, on a surface with boundary, I can always find such a, I can always satisfy this condition. I can always find a primitive where, um, the Liouville vector field is transverse to the boundary, and in fact, I can sort of I can arrange this for any collection of numbers that satisfy this. So if if this basically says that at least one of the AI has to be positive, right? Because because this area is positive, so so if the sum is positive, at least one of them has to be positive. But other than that, I have no constraint except for the sum should be equal to the area.
And, and so in particular, so if for any given boundary, I get to decide whether it's ingoing, incoming or outgoing, except that I, I need at least one where it's outgoing. Okay? So that, that's what happens in dimension two. So any surface with boundary in an area form um, is a, has such, such primitives. Now, uh, a little fact which, well, I guess it's another exercise that's slightly more tricky, but also not very hard, that if you go to higher dimensions, so if the dimension of W is at least four, and there exists a primitive lambda such that y is transverse to the boundary of w, then the type of each boundary component is completely determined. by omega restricted to that boundary component. Right? So, so basically what I'm saying is, so, I'll, so V, which is the boundary of W, I'll write as a disjoint union of components, as I did here, and then I'm saying that in higher dimensions, I don't, I'm not free to choose whether the given component is incoming or outgoing, it's already, if, if I can find such a transverse vector field at all, then it's predetermined by the local geometry near that boundary component. So, um, yeah, if you get stuck, ask me, and I'll give you a hint. Yeah? Yes, yeah, so, so, so here the, the, the main statement is that I can find this lambda in such a way that if I take the vector field with respect to this lambda, well, I mean, I can find this lambda with, which, with this property, and then once I have the lambda, then if I build the vector field, then it automatically will satisfy this. That's the statement. So the main part is constructing the lambda. Once you have the lambda with these properties, then this, is, this basically follows from the definitions. All right. So... So a Liouville, so now the definition a Liouville domain is a compact exact symplectic manifold uh, W D lambda such that the negative part of the boundary, so, so the, the part where my dual vector field, my dual vector field points in, is empty. So it only has positive boundary. Right? Notice that once I say compact and exact, it must have boundary, because on a closed symplectic manifold, uh, omega defines a non-trivial cohomology class, so it can never be exact. So, so then, this is what the definition is. And so, so here are some examples. So surfaces with area forms with, with the right kind of primitive will be examples. Um, so let's look at some more examples. So we could take the ball inside R2n with a canonical symplectic form, and as lambda, we could take one half summation xj dyj minus yj dxj, right? So for that, then um, my Liouville vector field y will be, uh, well, one half summation x, xj dxj plus yj dyj. So this will be 
up to scale, this will be the radial vector field. Right? So the picture is that my y will be um, will look like that. It will have a zero at zero, and otherwise it will be expanding, and it will have all the properties we want. So that's one example. And uh, another interesting example which we can have is if we look at let Q uh, be any Riemannian manifold, a closed Riemannian manifold, then we can look at d star q, which is a subset. These are all the, um, the co-vectors p and t star q, such that if I look at the norm with respect to this metric, or I mean the dual vector metric on the cotangent bundle of g, this is less than or equal to 1. This is a compact subset now of the cotangent bundle. Um, and if I take the canonical, uh, the Liouville form on the canonical one form on T star Q, it's usually written as PDQ, which is understood to mean summation PJ DQJ in local coordinates. Um, then, and this will be another example of a Leo the domain. And here, my my y will be sum, summation p j d p j. So, schematically, I have my cotangent bundle, and basically, it does it looks like that in each fiber. Right? So in each fiber, it's a radial vector field. And so again, it expands the symplectic form, and it's transverse to the boundary of the disk bundle, which is something like this. Right? Maybe I should use a different... So this is like the boundary. This is the sphere bundle, which is... So these are all the co-vectors of length one. Okay. Um, right. What else did I want to say at this point? Oh, yeah, we have another class of examples. How am I doing on time? Okay. So another class of examples, maybe I'll just say this in words, comes from Stein manifolds. So if you have a complex manifold with a an exhausting plurisupharmonic function, then from that plurisupharmonic function you could build a lambda and also a, a, a symplectic form. And, and so then if you take a, some compact subset, like for example a sublevel set of a regular value, then that will be another example of a Leoville domain like that. So um, often one actually looks at um, Liouville domains which have one more property which is which the ones that I've described so far have and which sort of gives them slightly more structure. So here's another definition. The Liouville domain is called a Weinstein domain. If my vector field Y, my Liouville vector field, is gradient-like,
for a function phi from W to R. Um, and let me, let me just sort of zoom just so that things are nice, such that the boundary of W is a regular level set of phi. And so, so once I have one such function, I can always change it to make this true. And so what are the functions in, in my example? So on the ball, I could just take phi to be phi of x, y could just be norm of x squared plus norm of y squared. Right? So, so it's just the norm of my, my point in R, R to n squared. And, and here, my phi would be norm of p squared. And I guess, I mean, I don't need the one half, it doesn't matter, since I'm only assuming gradient like, but somehow it's customary to, to take that here. And uh, the additional thing for, for these Weinstein domains is that they have sort of a more manageable topology than a general Liouville domain. Actually, so we, no, we don't know very much about a general Liouville domain. It's, they're sort of not really all that well understood. So, so Weinstein domains are the ones that are most studied. And here's another exercise. So, so we have this function phi. Um, and I guess, yeah. And the exercise is that if W lambda phi is a Weinstein domain, and let's say phi is a Morse function, then the indices of the, of the critical points of this Morse function are bounded above by half the dimension of W. Right, so, so basically what that says is that my, my W is, has topology of a half-dimensional comp uh, CW complex. Okay. So, um, yes. And the reason for that is basically, so I'll give you a hint for that exercise. The reason is if you look at the if you look at the flow of oh yeah I guess too many phi's and my flows are also phi let me call this f anyway um, so if you look at the flow of, of the Liouville vector field y which is sort of generally moving towards the boundary so and I so then then these these cells um, that that correspond so so the index corresponds to the dimension of the stable manifold of this flow, and so the hint is the stable manifolds of all critical points are isotropic, and once they're isotropic, then they have at most half dimension. So, so that's the statement, and yeah. So, so general Liouville domains can have higher dimensional topology. That, so they they can have the, the homotopy type of a CW complex of dimension two n minus one. So, so you just 
I mean, it's a manifold with boundaries, so it always doesn't have any top dimensional topology, but could have anything lower than that. And first examples were given by Dusa, McDuff, and then later uh, Geiges produced more examples, and then Chris and collaborators produced even more examples. And so, but, but still, it's sort of general Liouville domains are far less well understood than, than Weinstein domains. Any questions so far? Good. So, so maybe one, one remark. So, any Weinstein domain can actually be built inductively by sort of attaching Weinstein handles. So, so, so in Morse theory, you know that you could build your, your manifold by attaching one K handle for every critical point of index K. And now the point is that in this context here, you could actually do this attachment symplectically. So you could, a Weinstein domain can be built by successive symplectic handle attachment. Starting from a ball, and then you, you add a bunch of one handles, you add a bunch of two handles, and so on, until, and, handles of, so where, where the core has dimension n, these are called critical, and the Weinstein domain is called subcritical if it doesn't have any critical handles. These kind of will play a, a special role in the theory. That it will turn out that their symplectic homology will be zero. Um, okay. So now the the boundary of a Weinstein domain actually has more structure. So um, this yeah. So here's the next remark. So The restriction alpha, which is lambda, restricted to the boundary of W, is actually a contact form on the boundary. Right? I mean, you see this in the examples. So if I take this form and I restrict it to the sphere, I get a contact form, and the same. For, for the standard, uh, for the canonical one form, if I restrict it to the unit cotangent bundle, I also get a contact form. And that's a general phenomenon. Um, it's easy calculation that this is true. And a neighborhood, the, so if I look at the, the negative flow, or sort of negative time, say, let's say negative time flow of my Liouville vector field Y, I can embed the negative half of a simplexation of this contact manifold into my W.
So how does that work? So basically, um, so this, what's the simplification first? Well, there are two models. I can either think of R times V with coordinate S here and then whatever point, points here. Let's call them X. And then if I use this as my model, then my symplectic form on it would be the exterior derivative of e to the s times alpha. So that would be one way of writing the symplectization. Alternatively, by taking um, the t taking uh, e to the s as my primary coordinate, so I can instead I could also think of zero times uh, of the of the of the positive half line times v where now here let's call this coordinate rho, and then I would take the symplectic form rho times alpha, right? And so here the negative half would really be sort of everything from minus infinity to zero. Here sort of my, my v sits inside this at level one, and the negative half would correspond to, so, The negative half, in this case, which I'm sort of going to use from now on, would be this part of it. This is the part that has finite. So notice that sort of anything. So if I if I fix a level in here, if I fix in some either the real number s in R or a real number rho in zero infinity, and I look every, at everything above that number then that has infinite volume with respect to this form, whereas everything below has finite volume. Right? So, so these two ends of, of this symplectization behave very differently. And that's, that's why usually symplectizations we, we draw like this. This appeared already in, in Mike's talks. Right? He had also this discussion. So, so typically I have my V sitting, sitting somewhere, so in this model at, at zero, in this model at one. And then if I look at everything below, it has finite volume. If I look at everything above, it has infinite volume. So, and the, the Liouville vector field will just be sort of the, the one that points in this direction. And, right, so, so this is, this with, with this symplectic form, that's a negative half of the symplectization. And I can embed it just by using the flow. Well, I guess if I use the flow, it's more natural to, 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 look at it in this model, but I mean, there's an obvious map from, from one to the other, which sort of just takes S to E to the S, right? Um, all right, and so now, once we know that the negative half embeds, that we can just glue on the positive half just by using this embedding to sort of glue the two things together. So, We can use this to build the completion w hat lambda hat of w lambda, where w hat is just w union along the boundary with, now let me take the positive half in this model of the symplectization um, no this is just this is just a space it's, it's just this and it's glued along the common boundary and my lambda hat when restricted to w should just be my old lambda and lambda hat restricted to uh, this part should be uh, rho times alpha, right? And at the boundary, when, when rho is equal to one, this is also just the restriction of lambda to the boundary, so this glues nicely to a globally defined one form. And so basically now, the picture is, the picture you should have in mind is you have your You have your Liouville domain, and now it has boundary, and now what we've done is we've glued on sort of this, this infinite cylinder, this half-infinite cylinder on the boundary. 
right? So, so this is W, and the whole thing is my domain, uh, my completion. Okay. And so, so if I look at, back at my examples, if I complete the ball, then I just get back R2N. If I complete the unit cotangent bundle, then I just get back the whole cotangent bundle. But somehow it's useful to, to first sort of look at the domain because that somehow builds in some finiteness of the topology. And so basically, I mean, I could have set things up to say, well, I have a, I have a symplectic manifold which is exact and such that outside of a compact set, it looks like the positive half of a simplicization, but it's sort of more useful to do it the other way around, at least for what my point of view is. And uh, actually, I'm quite fast. So I could have gone slightly slower. I could have said a little bit more about stand domains, but anyway. Uh, so, so if you want, later we can do more examples. Um, so uh, now, now the question is what, what, what kind of interest does one have? So, so what kind of, well first, what kind of invariants do these things have? And then what kind of questions does one ask about these things? So the classical invariants of a Leo Deville domain are basically it's, it's diffeomorphism type and then, because it has a symplectic structure, then you also have churn classes and so on. So, and then the, the more modern invariants, of course, then are, come from holomorphic curve theories. And so, What are the typical questions that one wants to ask about these dual domains? Well, they basically depend on what your primary focus is. So, um, one possible focus, well, so, so the first type of, the first possible focus is that maybe you're not actually so much interested, I mean, your primary interest might not be in the domain itself, but just in the boundary, right? So, right, so if you have this contact manifold, V, it's with the contact structure given by, by some global one form, then what kind of questions can you ask? Well, the first question you might ask is, does it admit one of these fillings at all? Right, so. So does V admit an exact filling, meaning a Leoville domain such that the boundary of W is equal to, well, the boundary of W and lambda restricted to the boundary of W is equal to my V alpha. Right, that's, that's the first question. And then maybe the answer to this question is that, yes, and then you can ask, well, how many? Are there different ones? And how many are there? And so, so just to give you an idea of, of, of the type of result one gets for this. Um, so, One of the results in Gromov's pseudo-holomorphic curve paper from 85 can be rephrased as saying that for V, the standard uh, three-sphere with a standard contact form, um, all fillings are 
diffeomorphic to the ball. Actually, simplex to ball up, yeah. All you will fillings. Are diffeomorphic to the ball. And in fact, the symplectic structure, I think, is deformation equivalent to the ball. Right? With omega, deformation equivalent to the ball. But in higher dimensions, I think this question is completely open. So one, one would like to prove something similar in higher dimensions, but we don't have the techniques at the moment. And while Chris is here, I can also mention one of his results. Yeah, I mean, we... So, so what's the exact current status of this question? Okay, so the diffeomorphism type is known, but yeah, so, so the point, yeah part, of, yeah, part of the point of this theorem is that there are no exotic symplectic structures on R4 which are standard at infinity, and that the analogous result of that is not known in higher dimensions. Right. So, so I guess, yeah, so the diffeomorphism is still true in higher dimensions, but the, the deformation equivalence is not true. And... And there's a theorem by Chris that says if you, if you let V, so I'm not going to state the most general thing, but if you, if you take V to be the unit cotangent bundle of T2 with its standard contact structure, then again, every Leo will fill in. is deformation equivalent to the disk bundle with its standard symplectic form. So deformation equivalent means that you could, you first find a family of symplectic forms, a one parameter family of symplectic forms such that it starts at D of whatever you have, I mean, it starts at the one you have and moves to some other one, and then that other one is actually symplectomorphic to this. That's what, simple, that's what deformation equivalent means. All right. So these are sort of, these are sort of explicit, sort of essentially unique. I mean, this is the best you can hope for as a uniqueness result. And um, on the other hand, there are, no, there, there are contact three manifolds known that have, have infinitely many um, Leo will fillings, even sort of with, with all kinds of topology, and well, what's special about this thing that, that makes it work? Well, basically, you have a, you have a technique of, of so sort of the analog of filling with holomorphic disks kind of works in this setting. So, so you have you have finite energy planes that that sort of um, that sweep out this space and allow you to, to uh, sort of, that, well, that, they, that exist in a simplexization and you can push them into any filling that you're given and you, you, you have enough control to conclude that basically as, as they sweep through this space, there's not much that can happen and that eventually allows you to conclude that actually the topology has to be the one you already know. Is that sort of too much of a caricature? I mean, yeah. 
this, this, this kind of argument, maybe one thing one could say, this kind of argument very much depends on dimension four. Because it uses, among many other things, it uses positivity of intersection, and so that kind of thing sort of often comes up when you do holomorphic curves in dimension four, they're more, much more useful, or, or sort of much, they have been used much more in dimension four because sometimes you know for, for index reasons that uh, they cannot intersect, so once you have an embedded one, then locally, if you vary it, it sort of, the, the nearby th things sort of locally fill the space, and then sort of this, this, this non-intersection sort of gives you very strong information, whereas in higher dimensions, you wouldn't, if you have two-dimensional objects, say, in a six-manifold, you wouldn't expect them to intersect at, anyway, so, so, so this doesn't give you any additional sort of tool to work with, whereas in dimension four, this is extra information that can be used. All right, that, that's by uh, Richard Hind, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I yeah. I mean, I just, I, I, I didn't aim for completeness here, I just wanted to give you some hints of what, what the type of results are that are, are known. And I mean, the other thing one should say is that, of course, uh, if, if you start with an over-twisted contact manifold, and we now know what this means in all dimensions, then they don't have any fillings at all, so in particular they don't have these kinds of fillings. Right, so, so any, any V that appears as the boundary of the Lille domain is automatically type. Um, and what are other questions that one could ask with regards to, to these contact manifolds? Well, another type of question we could ask is, does the existence of a Leoville filling um, force special properties on the rape flow? And hopefully tomorrow I'll give you one example of the type of result you might get there. And in particular, you might ask sort of how many periodic orbits must this wave flow have for any contact form, or maybe can we prove ergodicity? or something like that. So that will be the kind of thing you might be interested in, or you might hope to say something about for the contact manifold, given that it has a filling. Now, you can turn this around and instead focus on W itself. Right, so, so this was if your focus is on, on, on the contact manifold. Now, if your focus is on W, then you could ask, well, what are its symplectic properties? So, so sample questions would be, which closed n manifolds admit Lagrangian embeddings. Into W or what about exact Lagrangian embeddings. <laughs> right.
right? I mean, there's another famous, we've, we've seen several Arnold conjectures already, there's another famous Arnold conjecture that says that if you have an exact closed Lagrangian submanifold of a cotangent bundle, then it should actually be Hamiltonian isotopic to the zero section, in particular it should be diffeomorphic to the zero section. That's open, mostly, and that's only known in very few cases. And that appears to be a very difficult problem, but sort of that's the kind of question you might want to ask. And, and so, on, on if, you're, if you're just interested in, in any Lagrangians, th that question is already interested, interesting for R2n, or well, for the ball. I mean, any closed, many, any closed Lagrangian, you can rescale it and put it into the ball if you can fit it into R2n at all. So, for n equal 1, you know the answer, circles and unions of circles certainly embed. And then for n equal 2, the answer is also known. Um, turns out that the only oriented closed two-manifold which has a Lagrangian embedding into R4 is the torus. And if you look at non-orientable ones, then the Euler characteristic must be divisible by 4 and the Klein bottle is forbidden. So zero is not allowed as, as Euler characteristic. And in dimension three, there are some restrictions known, but um, there's no complete answer yet. And in higher dimensions, even less is known. So there are some things that, that are known not to embed, but yeah, let me not get into that. So, so I just wanted to mention a bunch of questions. So, so these are two. So, Another type of question, which I already, sort of, which, which kind of already appeared before in the, in the case of, in, in the case of the ball, is the question: Well, if you fix the, the diffeomorphism type of your W, can you put different non-symplectomorphic Liouville structures on it? Right. How many non diffeomorphic Or, yeah, I guess. This way is too strong because it's always going to be infinitely many because I can always rescale. So, so I want to say non deformational equivalent, maybe. <laughs> Viewable structures. Can we put on on a given domain? Right, that that might be another kind of question. And here it turns out that there's another theorem. So so these were results by. Well, there, there were first examples by, by Seidel, and then there were more examples by Mark McLean, and then there were still more examples by Abu Zaid and Seidel. So let me put these three names here. So Mohammed and Paul Seidel, and also Mark McLean, they proved that uh, on, well, in my notation, on B2N, or, no, let, let, me, let me say on, on R2n, for n at least 3, there are infinitely many non-symplectomorphic level structures. And again, hopefully, I'll say a little bit more about how Mark proves this because the tool that he uses is symplectic homology. So, so hopefully, tomorrow I'll get to that. And yeah, so so I'm yeah I'm switching a little bit. So here I have domains, and here I'm I'm sort of I'm looking at the completed thing already. So so still 
These, now I'm thinking of R2n as a Liouville manifold, so it's an exact symplectic manifold which is cylindrical at infinity. So, so the topology is still finite. So, that, so there's, so, yeah, but I, I didn't want to, I mean, so, so to make the, the non-symplectomorphic statement, I, so, so once I complete, then, then sort of rescaling and sort of doing sort of naive deformations, they can be sort of, they, they disappear once I pass to, to the completion. And so now only, only sort of non-symplectomorphic becomes a non-trivial statement now. Right. So, so, right. So I guess I could have said, yeah, I could have formulated it this way. Yes. And finally, there's also sort of... Basically, in some sense, generalization of, of, this kind of, of these kinds of questions is, well, if you have two Leoville domains, when can you embed one into another? And there are two kinds of embeddings you can have. And let me finish with that. So, so this is another definition. So a Leoville embedding of one domain into another uh, is a diffeomorphic embedding, uh, 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 is a smooth embedding. I don't want diffeomorphism. Smooth embedding I from W0 into W1 such that if I pull back the Liouville form on W1, but I don't want to get the Liouville form back, that that's, will be sort of unnecessarily strong, but I want that this is the Liouville form on my W0, maybe, maybe scaled by some positive, um, by some positive number C, and then um, plus the differential of a function. Right? Because this is something that I wouldn't see in the symplectic form. So then, in particular, up to scale, they would be symplectomorphic, or maybe, maybe let me leave out the C. So maybe let's, let, let me just do this. So then, in particular, this would be a symplectic embedding, but it would be stronger than that. Sort of the primitives would sort of match in this way. What this says is that, basically, I can, by subtract, by extending this function f, to a neighborhood of W0, so sort of basically to, to W1, by sort of just cutting it off outside a neighborhood of W0, I can subtract it, its differential from lambda 1, and then I get a primitive for W1, which is sort of still looks the same at infinity, but now it just sticks to lambda 0. So, so after changing my, my lambda 1 in, in a neighborhood of, of the image, I can actually make them agree. Right, so, so the picture is, I have my W1, and inside, I have my W0, and then, basically, maybe, maybe the forms don't agree on the nose, but then I can, I can change, I can deform the lambda 1 so that after the deformation they agree. That's the meaning of that. that that's sort of, that's sometimes, so a Liouville embedding or an exact embedding, you could also just ask for a symplectic embedding. And then the question would be, when do such embeddings, or also just symplectic embeddings, exist? Right, so you start with two domains and you ask when can you embed one into the other. And 
Yeah, so I have 10 seconds left, so maybe this is a good place to stop. Maybe one thing to say is if, if W0, I mean, how, I, I said this is sort of a generalization of these kinds of questions. Why is that? Well, if your W, you could take as your W0 the unit disk cotangent bundle of a, of a manifold. And then if that embeds, then since in the unit disk cotangent bundle you have the zero section sitting in there as a Lagrangian submanifold, then that would also imply that, that you have a Lagrangian embedding of the corresponding Q. And conversely, if you have the Lagrangian embedding, some disk, then, then the, the neighborhood theorem tells you that some disk bundle actually sits inside your, your ambient domain. So in that sense, this is sort of more general because now the W0 doesn't have to be a disk cotangent bundle, it could be something more complicated. So let me stop here and ask for questions. No, but it will, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm still, I would want to deform through Liouville structures, so, so, the, deform, so the, the contact form might not be fixed on the boundary, but the contact structure will be. At least in the way I, I, want, I would want to, you could, you could do this more generally, but in the way I want to phrase the question at the moment, I would, I would fix the contact structure on the boundary. I mean, actually, it turns out that these, in, in, in this theorem, um, the, the contact structures that you get on, on the sphere at infinity will turn out also to be non, many of them will be non-contact homomorphic. But, so you could tell them apart that way, but. Yes, but I mean, isotopy sort of then sort of by grace theorem wouldn't, wouldn't actually be a variation. Yeah. Yes, okay. I'm sorry? So, so, in, in, so the way I want to think of deformation equivalence, they would be isotopic. But here, in, in the, the, the structures that you get here, they will typically not be isotope. They, they will typically get different contact structures. So, so they don't have examples in these dimensions where the contact structure at infinity is standard, but the thing is not. That would be a much bigger theorem. But I mean, this, is, this was already interesting, but, but the other one would be even more interesting. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the, the reason this is interesting is that you, yeah, I mean, once, once, you, once you would have sort of interesting structures on, on R2, uh, once you had, have symplectic structures on R2n, which are standard at infinity, then you can rescale them and implant them into any symplectic manifold. And then basically that would sort of suggest that, that symplectic once you have any symplectic structure on a manifold, you can have sort of arbitrarily complicated ones in the same cohomology class. And so, yeah, I mean, it, this is an interesting question. And in dimension four, it's this, Gromov's theorem says that that's not possible, but in higher dimensions, it might be. Other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Yanko.